The island of Cuba has been under the yoke of the Castro dictatorship for more than 60 years, a period of time in which the island has become one of the poorest countries in the Americas. According to available estimates, the situation has caused more than 1 million people to leave the island over the last 25 years, and that's despite only having a total population of just over 11 million inhabitants. It's a huge exodus that, far from slowing down, is gaining more and more speed. To give you an idea, during the first nine months of 2022 alone, it is estimated that nearly 200,000 Cubans escaped from the island to the United States. A historical maximum that surpasses any previous period. So that is the state of Cuba right now, something we will talk about at length here on Visual Politic in the future. The fact is that, in spite of this complex situation, in general, the Castro dictatorship has not had that much bad press. Yes, practically everybody accepts that Cuba is a dictatorship, but a dictatorship with a surname. There have always been myths that have contributed to whitening the image of Castroism. And in fact, as incredible as it may seem, Fidel Castro was one of the most popular politicians in all of Latin America during the 20th century. And yes, we know, Fidel had many detractors, but also many supporters and many stalwarts. One of the most effective communication strategies of the Cuban regime has been to regularly send hundreds and hundreds, thousands even, of doctors to troubled countries. Yes, Cuban doctors have certainly become very famous, from Italy to Jamaica to Venezuela, passing through all kinds of crises and disasters throughout the world. However, did you know that these medical missions generate millions of dollars in income for the regime? Well, visual politic viewers, in this video I'm going to tell you how one of the best businesses generated by Havana in the last 50 years came about. Check this out. Over the years, Cuban medicine has become one of the great legends of the Castro regime. I'm sure almost all of you have heard this story. That of a people punished by the diabolical US blockade who, despite everything and overcoming all adversaries, has managed to build a healthcare system at the forefront of the world. Too bad the real story is quite different, especially if you're an average Cuban Joe. Or Jose. Yes, Cuba does allocate a large chunk of its resources to the medical system. It is estimated that approximately 11% of its GDP. Supposedly, this has allowed for relatively good statistics in areas such as average life expectancy and infant mortality. However, there is a problem. This Oxford study you see on the screen suggests that the statistics are manipulated and that they are also biased by their own economic situation. For example, there were virtually no cars, and without cars, there are no fatal road accidents. What's more, in Cuba there is not a single healthcare system, but two different systems which coexist. On the one hand, there is the healthcare system for both foreigners and the Cuban elite, a system whose mission is to earn foreign currency through medical tourism. Of course, as you can imagine, this is the island's cutting edge system, and it is forbidden to ordinary Cubans. They have access to a very different healthcare system where the infrastructure is crumbling and supplies of all kinds are lacking. To give you an idea, when a patient has to go to one of these public hospitals, they have to bring their own sheets, towels, food, and soap. The images speak for themselves. It is a very different story from the one that is usually paraded and the one that explains a totally different reality. Cuba recognises a severe shortage of medicines for all types of diseases. In any case, what is undeniable is that Cuba has built such a good reputation that friends of the regime do not hesitate to travel to the island for treatment of any medical problem. As you can see, the true creme de la creme. Evo Morales anticipates his trip to Cuba to undergo surgery. Chavez travels to Cuba to undergo a special treatment. The Venezuelan parliament authorizes the president to be absent for an indefinite period of time. I don't know how to say thank you to this country, said Florencia Kirchner on her farewell to Cuba. The daughter of Vice President Cristina Fernandez and the late former president Nestor Kirchner briefly described in her Instagram account her stay and treatment in the Caribbean country before returning to Argentina. Where is Daniel Ortega? The Nicaraguan president's long absence in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic stimulates rumors about his health. Dora Mara Tellez, who was a member of Ortega's cabinet in the 1980s, considers it very possible that he is in Cuba. In one way or another, Cuban healthcare has become one of the island's great instruments of soft power, a huge loud hailer for the revolution. I'm sure you all remember news items like this one. Cuba sends medical brigades to Italy and Latin America to face the coronavirus. Cuban doctors go to Andorra, their second European destination against COVID-19. 
Cuban doctors would stay in Mexico longer than expected if cases of COVID-19 increase. In September of 2005, Fidel Castro even ordered the creation of an international contingent of physicians specializing in disasters and major epidemics to assist the United States in the aftermath of the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. This group was called the Henry Revie International Medical Brigade. Later, the brigade continued its work and was commended by the World Health Organization for its involvement in Africa in containing the Ebola outbreak. And the question is, what is really behind all these missions? Is everything as clean as it seems? Well, in this video, we are going to discover what is behind all of these operations. This, visual politic viewers, is the flip side of Cuba's best diplomatic tool. Check this out. Health, diplomacy, and revolutionary solidarity. In 1963, the Sands War took place, a war between Algeria and Morocco, where Cuba intervened in a geopolitical context in which the island nation used to take part in various wars in favour of the sides aligned with the Soviet Union. Of course, on this occasion, something very particular happened. The lack of doctors in the area made Fidel Castro come up with the strategy of sending brigades of health professionals to cover the shortage and assist the soldiers and the victims of the conflict. It was the dress rehearsal of a policy that would become increasingly massive, common and systematic. Although, here's a little aside, it may surprise you, but between 1960 and 1990, the Cuban armed forces carried out at least eight military interventions in the world, five of them in Africa, Algeria, Syria, Congo, Angola and Ethiopia, and the rest were in Central America and the Caribbean. Caribbean. Let's just say that during the Soviet era, the Cuban army became an expeditionary troop at the service of the communist revolution. However, the increasing failure of these expeditions began to push Castro to conceive of a different way of influencing third countries, perhaps a friendlier way. And that is how, after the Algerian experience, the curious strategy of the medical brigades began to appear. Since that first trial in 1963, according to figures promoted by the regime itself, some 600,000 Cuban healthcare workers have provided medical services in more than 160 countries. And take note, because there are currently some 30,000 Cuban doctors who seem to be active and deployed in 67 countries. We are talking about a well-oiled system of soft power, both logistically and economically. Especially when we consider that Cuba has turned this activity into a huge business. And yes, you heard correctly, a huge and lucrative business. Check this out. A very profitable business for the regime. Cuba is traditionally a hermetic country in everything that involves the government. That's the thing about dictatorships. They're not exactly the most transparent places. However, in spite of all this, since the year 2000, certain methods and rules regarding the recruitment and financing of medical programs around the world have become known, which, to tell the truth, did not sit well with the most basic rights of any worker. And somewhat later, in March 2010, the Cuban government issued Resolution Number 168, which establishes the Disciplinary Regulations for Cuban Civilian Workers Serving Abroad as Collaborators. Check this out. The document has been very controversial since its release, among other reasons because of the infractions it establishes regarding the discipline related to the prestige and social conduct of employees. For example, this regulation sanctions behaviours such as those you see on the screen. Article 8G, to maintain relations with nationals or foreigners whose conduct is not in accordance with the principles and values of society. Article 8J, to maintain friendly relations or ties of any other kind with Cuban citizens, whether or not they reside in the country where the collaboration is provided, and who constitute promoters of a way of life contrary to the principles that should be characterised a Cuban collaborator abroad. And Article 8P, not to inform superiors of gifts received from nationals or foreigners. That is to say, no fraternisation with non-revolutionary and non-communist people. And of course, no relations, even of friendship, that are not notified and approved by their superiors. And these are just three examples of a long, long list of disciplinary regulations that regulate every aspect of the life of medical workers abroad. And of course, all Cuban doctors are subject to the penal code in the event they allow themselves to be tempted by the capitalist comforts that many find in the countries where they render their services. The public official or employee in charge of fulfilling a mission in another country who abandons it, or having fulfilled it, or having been requested at any time to return, expressly or tacitly refuses to do so, incurs the penalty of deprivation of liberty from three to eight years. Article 176.1 of the Cuban Penal Code. In view of this, I don't know, it doesn't seem that such a strict code with extensive control over the lives of workers fits well with the image of volunteering doctors coming to provide altruistic help. And the question is, will there be a backlash? 
Well, the truth is that in 2009, the United Nations Special Rapporteurs on Trafficking in Persons of Contemporary Forms of Slavery dedicated part of their work to Cuba and the economic circuit designed to raise millions of dollars from these missions, which were no longer viewed as so humanitarian. Among other things, the rapporteurs asked the Cuban government to explain this information and take action. The government of Cuba would receive a sum of money from the host governments and pay the workers a portion of those funds. In countries where the host government pays the Cuban worker directly, the Cuban worker must pay back to the government of Cuba a percentage of his or her salary, which would increase from 75% to up to 90% of his or her monthly salary. UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery 2019. That is, not only can they not have unapproved relationships, refuse to work or seek to settle in another country, but Cuban health workers are also not paid in a manner consistent with the work they're doing. According to a report by Prisoners Defenders, of the US 10,700 for three months, approximately $3,560 per month, that the Mexican government paid for each of the 585 Cuban doctors and nurses serving in the country's capital, Havana only gave them $600 for three months, $200 a month, as a fixed charge in the country. In other words, the Cuban government kept 94.4% of the amount it's charged for its doctors and gave them a pittance on which it is not even possible to have a decent standard of living in Mexico. But that's not all. The UN officials also asked for clarification on the working hours and schedules that the health workers are forced to work. The doctors would work 48 hours per week, plus an additional 16 hours on call, which increases to a total of 64 hours per week, often including Saturdays and Sundays. The excess of hours worked illustrates the labor exploitation to which Cuban doctors abroad would be subjected. UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery 2019. All at the service of the revolution, or rather, of the revolution's top brass. And these conditions were precisely the ones that made the European Parliament itself condemn the Cuban medical mission system in June 2021. For the first time, a major political institution clearly pointed out the real nature of the Cuban missions. The European Parliament condemns the systemic violations of human and labor rights committed by the Cuban state against its health personnel sent to serve abroad on medical missions. European Parliament Resolution of 10th of June 2021 on human rights and the political situation in Cuba. But wait a minute, because beyond labor exploitation and diplomatic influence and soft power, Cuba's health missions may have another, much more dodgy objective. No less than directly exporting the revolution. Check this out. Beyond Appearances Venezuela has probably been the country where Cuban medical missions have intervened the most. In fact, Hugo Chavez himself made the issue one of his campaign axes in the 2012 presidential elections. ¿Te das cuenta? Todo eso lo cerraría el majunche. Todo eso se acabaría. Porque lo primero que ellos harían sería expulsar a esos hermanos y hermanas nuestras que han venido aquí a servirle al pueblo venezolano pero que la burguesía venezolana odia los hijos y las hijas de Fidel Castro, el padre de todos los revolucionarios de este continente. It is known that the regime maintained and maintains a close collaboration with Cuba, and that also, in exchange for Cuban doctors, Venezuela delivered oil to the Cuban regime. But that is not all. It is suspected, and there are quite clear indications, that these brigades, in many cases, also acted as a kind of Trojan horse. Thanks to them, and as part of the medical teams, many members of Cuban intelligence were deployed in Venezuela to infiltrate all levels and layers of the Venezuelan society and support the Chavez regime. That is why when the Mexican government of Andres Manuel López Obrador recently announced a similar, though much smaller, program of Cuban doctors, alarms were raised about the consequences this could have, about the risk that the Cuban intelligence might try to take advantage of these missions to do the same thing it had done in Venezuela, to try and control the country and sow the flame of the revolution, or at least use the network to develop and exploit illegal businesses to gain influence and foreign currency. Given that in this case the deployment is very small, the real risk seems very limited. But what can I say? Having Cuban intelligence services operating openly in a country does not seem like the best idea in the world. Well, this is the flip side of the Cuban medical missions. These missions do not only exploit thousands of health workers as if they were slave labor, but the regime uses them as an instrument of white power and even as a mechanism to infiltrate other countries. So the next time you see any news about these agreements, pay attention, because this is one of the most important strategies of influence and foreign currency generation for one of the most influential dictatorships of recent decades. Because as you know, in international politics, what seems honest can hide a terrible reality. But having said that, it's over to you. Did 
you know this modus operandi of Cuba around the world? What do you think of this type of strategy? Leave us your impressions in the comments and let's open a respectful debate. And if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of us here on Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next time.